Hi, I'm Richard. Uh, I'm a software engineer in one of the data teams at Mobility. And today, I kind of want to give you a quick overview of how we've brought relevancy search to Mobila and kind of the individual things we had to build and put within our infrastructure to allow this. So what is Mobility for a quick kind of overview for people who don't know? It's, um, we are kind of Germany's biggest online vehicle marketplace, have around 1.6 million adverts uh, online at any one time. And we're basically a platform that allows sellers and sellers of vehicles, usually dealers, to connect with buyers. Um, we offer kind of this as our core service, and on top of this, we have a number of different services uh, like financing. We are involved in the financing transactions or private selling. And we're part of the kind of global larger eBay classifieds group, which is um, as a larger organization, focuses on all things classified throughout the world. And this is brands such as uh, eBay Kleinanzeigen here in Germany, uh, Mark Platz in the Netherlands, and Kijiji Autos in Canada. So kind of one of our core functionalities at Mobila is search. It's um, the entrance point to our platform for users. And it's where they come on, narrow down what vehicle they're looking for. And they can do this by using industry standard type filters, you know, um, <coughs> filtering on make and model, price, mileage, things like this. And the user's then shown a list of results. And these car adverts kind of include various details about the car, um, a description, mileage, pictures, things like this. And they can, be, they can change the order uh, by various methods, price, listing, creation date, mileage, things like this. So um, we decided that as a company, we wanted to offer our users a new sort option, uh, relevance and recommendation, to help them find the right car more easily. So, <clears throat> what does a good relevance and recommendation look like to us as a business? Um, we have many different aspects to consider. Uh, of course, there are the hard constraints, the make, and mo uh, make, model, color, anything that the user sets, we have to show them. If they search for a black BMW, we don't show them a blue Audi. Uh, but on top of that, we have a number of different features. For example, business value. So our dealers have the option to have different types of accounts and bookable features. And we have to make sure they get value for money. If they've paid to be more prominent than the listings with, say, kind of a featured advert, that has to be taken into account. We also have these what we call general attraction factors, which are when we recommend an advert to our users, we kind of take into account things about the dealer. So where are they located? How highly rated is this dealer on our platform? Do people generally have a good experience with them? And does this dealer look after our users? Do they respond when they're asked a question? Or is it a case they kind of ignore it and maybe the car's sold and our users don't know? Talking about users, we also have our users' preferences. So like I said earlier, we have make, we have model, things that everyone searches for when looking for a car. But on top of that, we want to really understand what our users view on our platform, how they behave, uh, what they're looking for, and that way we can begin to kind of get this idea of relevance for this specific user. And finally, listing quality. When we recommend listings to our users, uh, we want to do so knowing that listings are high quality. And for this, we look at things like the number of images the dealers put up. How complete is this listing compared to other listings? And is there a good description? Uh, one more thing we knew we wanted to have that kind of fits into this jigsaw puzzle is that when we recommend cars, we wanted some kind of concept of what a good offer was. Uh, so when you're a car buyer, it can be daunting to try and determine if the car you're viewing is a good deal. And we knew that we could help with that. And we eventually decided on using a thing called price rating, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. So kind of this is uh, quite simple, but we had the idea of perfect relevance search, and we had, to decide, uh, we had a choice to make. Do we take the old-fashioned waterfall approach where we sit in a room and code the perfect platform and release it once it's done? Or instead, do we re release incremental components of our search with the end goal of combining all of these to create perfect relevancy? And I'm sure kind of everyone can guess we went for the iterative approach. Uh, it makes more sense for us. The implementation of such a large project was never going to happen overnight. And we might as well capture the small gains to user experience as we go. 
It also allows us to test ideas really quickly and to gain insights into what features our users actually care about, not what we think they care about. So we kind of had this idea of the perfect search, and we decided how we were going to go about building it to solve our problem. So we first had to kind of decide where did we want to start. And we felt the natural place to start is what search is all about, um, helping users find cars. So we started with our user preferences. And this kind of topic was broken up into really three separate questions. Who are our users? Before we could even start to build smart data products, we need an understanding of who our users are and how to keep track of them. So for this, we created what we call like our event service. And basically, every interaction with the front end of our platform is recorded. Uh, visitor ID is attached to each one. This is tracked, stored in our Hadoop cluster after kind of enrichment and data cleanup, compliance, these kind of things. And then it's available for our data scientists to use to build products. And with this, we had this idea of like exactly what goes on in our platform. And it turns out quite a lot goes on. We generate roughly 300 million interactions with the site per day. So with that, what could we do? We kind of needed to understand what they were looking for. So to understand what users are looking for, we had to create this. We created a microservice. And it basically stores aggregate user activities daily for the last 30 days in Cassandra. And when this API is called, uh, for example, by our search platform, the profile returned includes preferences for this user about a number of different things. You know, what uh, continuous features like price, like how, where does, what does this user's price distribution look like? What does their um, mileage distribution look like? And then also more categorical information. What makes do they look at? What models? And fuel types. And this kind of allowed us to actually know what our users look at. The next step is obviously, well, then we need to use that data somehow. So what should we show them? With this profile information, we kind of could show users results that match their preferences. So our first iteration of Relevancy Search, Relevancy Search 1.0, uses this um, user behavior to match cars to them. So when a search request is executed on our platform, it's enriched with this profile, and an elastic search query is generated that respects both the original search, your hard filters, make and model, with additional weighting for features based on how closely this advert matches this user's profile. And this was kind of our first smart product at Mobila. And uh, from a technical point of view, this project had many key outcomes for us. It allowed us to understand how to track user interactions, how to generate actionable information, and even more importantly, how to use this information to generate relevance for our users. And from a business point of view, we did see there was a growth of demand for dealers, because users were showing more relevant adverts, and so they were contacting dealers more often. And this kind of reassured business that, OK, these guys in the data team, they, they do know what they're doing. Um, we, they can leverage our data to generate real business results. So with that done, we kind of moved on to this concept of what a good offer is on our platform. Um, and if you look at these two listings, you can kind of see that they're pretty similar. You know, uh, it's not immediately obvious which one of these is better, unless you're someone who's really into cars. They're the same price. Um, the top car's slightly newer. The bottom car has a lower mileage. They're similar when it comes to their actual make and model. So unless you're a truly informed buyer, it can be really hard to work out whether or not you're getting value for money. And we thought we could help with this. Luckily, we're a car listing platform. We had a lot of data about cars. So we had kind of listing prices, mileages, attributes, everything that one needs to think about when determining the value of a car. And so we introduced these price rating labels. Um, our price rating basically works by looking at how much cars that match the specification of the current listing have been listed for previously. And it uses this value to determine whether a listing price is very good, it's a fair price, it's overpriced, you know, or, or one of these buckets for this car. And from a technical point of view, it kind of was approached as a typical machine learning fashion. We had lots of data about listings on our platform, um, exploration, cleanup, things like this. And the data scientists trained an offline machine learning model to do price prediction. And when we had this model, we deployed it as a microservice in our infrastructure. It's um, using H2O. 
And the microservice basically uses this model to provide price ratings for a given advert through a REST API. So whenever an ad is updated on our service, uh, on our platform, sorry, it calls this price rating service. A label is returned for the advert, and this is stored alongside the advert in our database and indexed into our Elasticsearch cluster to be available at query time. And again, this kind of had more, out, more key outcomes for us because it taught us a number of things. It gave us the, both the confidence and the skills and the knowledge that we had the infrastructure to create low latency machine learning projects and to put them online and deploy them in a way that fits with our platform. And our users really appreciated these price rating labels. It helped for them to demystify the car buying process, and they felt like we were on their side. So we gained quite a lot of um, trust with our users. They, they think we're there for them. However, dealers did not really like this feature. Quite often, they felt that the pricing was unfair um, based on their experience as a car dealer. But whether or not this is true, the data says one thing, they say another. Um, they also really felt like they lost control over the process because we were now telling dealers, uh, we were telling users, sorry, this is a good price for a car. They weren't telling them that. So these are two like small kind of services that we deployed on our way to building this proper relevancy search. Um, so we kind of had this user information now, and we proved our concept that showing more relevant adverts to user uh, leads to more demand in what we call Search 1.0. Uh, and we now also had this idea of what a good deal is on our platform and what isn't. So we wanted to combine these products with our kind of other defined search pe features or parts of the puzzle from earlier on to create like our most user relevant search to date. And this is where learning to rank comes into it. Um, so we decided on this approach for our version 2.0 due to a number of different factors. Kind of, We had some data scientists within the team who knew a bit about learning to rank, who uh, were at least aware of it. Uh, we had other people who were interested in learning how to use it, data scientists, engineers, and uh, kind of were interested in moving from the academic to applying it in the real world. And finally, it fit into our existing infrastructure quite easily. So learning to rank is like a supervised machine learning approach, um, and it tries to produce the most relevant ordering of results for a given input list. Now, training data in this takes the form of kind of uh, lists with some partial order specified by a judgment of relevancy. And the purpose of the model is to rank items in new unseen lists in a way that produces a similar ranking to that seen in the training data, and it maximizing the relevancy for the user. So the example on the left is, like, is a Google search. And the way their search works on a, a really simplified, really basic level, and I apologize if anyone from Google is here, um, they have a list of queries and documents that match the given query. And from this, a relevance degree is created. But in the case of Google, this is performed manually by, by raters or human assessors. Now, I've searched for learning to rank here. Um, and the results are ordered 3 to 0 in terms of relevancy. Now, the top results in an academic paper that introduces learning to rank, that sounds like quite a relevant thing for this. But if you keep going down the list, you come to TF Ranking, which is a TensorFlow library. Now, I've only searched for learning to rank. I've not specified what I want to do with it. So that's maybe less relevant to the average user um, than a paper. And this is kind of a subjective approach to relevancy, and it needs to be judged by someone. Now, in our case, relevance is not as easy to define subjectively. Um, for example, if a user on our platform searches for a blue Mercedes, how can we look at a list of results that match this query and say, this blue Mercedes is more relevant than that blue Mercedes? We can't really. So in our approach, we don't use this human assessment. We don't use this subject, so much subjective. We had to generate some form of a relevancy signal to allow our model to train. Now, we're currently experimenting with different signals, and each of them have their own drawbacks and their own positives. Um, but for our first test, we're using whether a given advert was clicked or not in a set of results as a signal for relevancy. So on the right-hand side, we have results for Mercedes-Benz, and we have 010, the second advert was clicked. For that user, it was the most relevant advert, perhaps. And then when we train the model, we use kind of a large number of input features. And these are what tie together this with kind of the other products we built. So many of these features are derived from, with respect to the user's profile, uh, that's calculated earlier. 
for example, where does this listing sit within the distribution of this user's price preference? And how close to the mean is it? And our data also shows that the um, price rating labels we introduced are actually one of the most important features for this signal of relevancy, whether or not a user clicks. So we use a Java library called RankLib to train our learning to rank models. It provides kind of a good collection of different learning to rank algorithms out of the box. And the models it generate integrate easily within our Elasticsearch-based infrastructure. And the reason it integrates easily is because there's a brilliant plugin called Elasticsearch Learning to Rank. Uh, it's an open source plugin um, created by open source connections and maintained by them. And it allows you to deploy your machine learning models and things like your feature transformations directly into your Elasticsearch cluster. And you can then use these at query time for re-ranking search results. So how does it look on our platform? Um, a search request comes in from our front end, and it reaches our search service. Now here, it's enriched with user preference information. And this is combined to generate your Elasticsearch queries with a little bit of this uh, re-ranking magic that comes from the Learning to Rank plugin. So this is basically the same process as Relevancy 1.0. And our Elasticsearch cluster contains all our adverts with all data that can be pre-calculated, so such as price rating, dealer ratings, uh, images, description, things like this. Our query is then executed against this cluster, and every document that matches hard filters your make, model, any user-defined hard filters, are given a score based on where the adverts fall in the distribution of user preferences. Again, the exact same as our first user relevancy search. Now, next, the top n results. And n, in our case, is around 100. This has been trial and error. Um, it's a mix between performance and uh, performance of the relevancy scoring and performance from a more technical uh, aspect. Uh, these are then rescored using this uh, machine learning model, uh, learning to rank. And the scores from the first step are basically thrown away. We discard them. And these adverts are then scored by our model. And this is based on all the different input features we have, which are things like where the advert falls in the distribution of user preferences. That's, a, that's an input. But also, other features like the completeness of the description the number of images, this dealer's rating relative to other dealers. All these kind of jig, uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces are input. And the result is returned to search uh, with the advert sorted by the highest relevancy score. So again, we're currently still testing our learning to rank solution. Um, but so far, the results look really promising. From our early insights, we've boosted the position of the median first clicked advert. And this is kind of one proxy we use for implicit user relevance. The higher the user clicks, the better the adverts we are showing them, we think. And in the longer run, hopefully, we'll also see changes in explicit user preferences, or explicit user experience, sorry. For example, net promoter score. If our, plat our hypothesis is, if our platform delivers better results, users are more likely to recommend it mobile to a friend. And from a technical point of view, we introduced Learning to Rank to our platform. It gave us a great deal of extra knowledge, especially in all things Elasticsearch. Uh, we've managed to get the required infrastructure in place. And so far, all requirements regarding latency, um, U CPU utilization, all these kind of things are well within bounds. It actually performs as good as normal search in some cases. So to wrap this kind of off, um, this project for us as a whole has many learnings. But some of the key ones were that Big data projects are safer to approach it irrevocably. It's much easier. from a business point of view. We need to show that the time and capital invested will be will result in something for the business, whether it's a demand for uh, increased demand for dealers or increased satisfaction of consumers. And technically, it also allowed us to learn on the job uh, while giving ourselves the greatest chance of success. It wouldn't have been great if we'd came back after a year and said, "Sorry, search doesn't work." Um, it, it also confirms to stakeholders that what we are doing with data makes sense and has a benefit. It, we can build smarter products. And finally, it served as a proof of concept that we can fit machine learning into our platform uh, and get great results. We've built up great experience, both in our team and kind of the further product and tech organization in Mobila. 
and it provides us with a solid foundation to build upon as we strive to make our products work better for our users. So um, hopefully that really quick overview has kind of sh shown what it looks like to some degree to introduce data products in an organization. And uh, thanks for listening. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>